Hello, Black Lamb Prairie Master Naturalists. My name is Molly Keck, and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in the Bear County or San Antonio area. And I have the privilege of covering entomology um, and an introduction to insects with you guys for your Master Naturalist intern training. Um, you normally have my retired now colleague, Dr. Mike Merchant, so this is definitely um, an honor to be able to try to fill his very, very large footsteps um, to cover this material for you. So what is entomology? Well, entomology is the study of insects and related arthropods. So an entomologist may study other things than necessarily insects, and we'll talk about what specifically insects are, but they might also study spiders or scorpions or assist people in how to manage those things, even mites and other things that might affect crops or other plants. One of the reasons why I got so interested in entomology is because there are so many different subtopics and other ways that you can study insects and you can see the list there underneath um, underneath that title but so many different subtopics that, and you can use insects as the specimen that you're studying in order to accomplish you know those uh, those topics so Insects are incredibly important in the medical field. We know that mosquitoes are the deadliest animal in the world to humans. More Mosquitoes kill more humans than humans even kill humans. So they're incredibly important, um, a major vector. But beyond what affects humans, there are many insects that affect your pets, that affect livestock, that um, affect wildlife. And so there's met medical and veterinary entomologists that are studying the effects of these vectors and these pests on human or animal health. Row crop, field crop, food production systems, entomologists are always studying the insects, the new invasive species, new crops that we're using and new insects that like to feed on it, and trying to help keep them at a lower threshold so that the farmers don't have to apply as many pesticides, can get a greater yield of their product, of their um, crops, and are able to sell more to the grocery store so we have more variety to choose from. But then there's also forest entomology. You can kind of see in that picture a, a field of, a forest of um, ash trees and an emerald ash borer is a new invasive species, relatively new to Texas, but um, somewhat new to the United States and can kill healthy ash trees. So there's a lot of foresters and, for, and entomologists that study forestry type topics to help manage our natural ecosystem and our natural forests. My field of expertise in entomology is urban and structural entomology, so I deal a lot with the insects that are invading your house, chewing up your house like termites do, ruining the place that we have our greatest investment in. And beyond what happens inside the house, also working with gardeners, pest management professionals, uh, naturalists, the general public on what is hurting my tree, what is hurting my tree, my plants outside, um, what insects are damaging, what are good to have there, how do I control leaf-footed bugs in my tomatoes of my vegetable garden. So insects that are associated with an urban environment, your, your landscape and your home. There's also, the reason to study insects also includes because they're beneficial. There are so many insects that are great to have around and we know that honeybees are the best at pollinating, but they are just one beneficial insect. They get a lot of attention and a lot of credit and I like to give them that credit. I love my honeybees, I am a beekeeper, but there are so many native bees. There are so many parasitoids like in this picture that are also beneficial that kind of go unnoticed or unrepresented. So insects are good and that's one reason to study them. We have to know who is beneficial so that we don't don't hurt the ones that we want to keep around. Insects also tell us a lot about our environment. They are environmental indicators. Certain insects found in certain environments can tell you if that environment is healthy, if that ecosystem is thriving, or if there is something out of balance there. And one great example is aquatic entomology. We can look at the, the animals, the insects that are found in an aquatic environment, and we can determine if there, it has great oxygenation, well-flowing streams, if it's starting to become stagnant, if there are issues that might be happening. So just by identifying the species of insects in a water system, you can tell a lot about the health of that water system. 
Insects are incredibly successful organisms. They have been around for so many years. And the reason for their success is because they are incredibly diverse. This is a picture of a lot of different insects and some of them are very different from one another, but they're all still insects. That's one of the most amazing things I think about them is that they are so incredibly diverse. You can compare two insects and may not even think that they're related and then realize that they actually are. Insects are also adapted to feed upon almost every natural concentration of organic matter on the earth. So they are found everywhere. They feed on fungal material, mold, decaying organic matter, dying plants, dead bodies, live trees, dead trees, anything that you can imagine, trash. There is an insect that specializes in feeding on it. We will talk about their rate of reproduction, but one of the reasons for their incredible success is that they have the ability to reproduce incredibly quickly. And this ability allows them to adapt very fast. An individual cannot adapt, but a population can. And so if a population has gone through five generations in two months, then they have the, that incredible ability to be able to adapt, evolve, accommodate themselves to changes in their environment. Some great success stories or some great adaptation stories. If you, if you appreciate adaptations of insects, evolutionary processes, you have got to appreciate the flea. Everything about this flea is adapted to living on and being a parasite of an animal with hair. The shape of its body, the pieces of its body that make it adapted so it's hard to pick it out, the ability to jump, the mouth parts adapted for sucking, the lack of wings when they should really have wings, the antenna that are tucked up underneath the head so that it doesn't get in the way as they're crawling through the hair. Nobody likes fleas. No one likes to deal with them. But I think we can all appreciate how they're adapted to the environment that they live in. And then some insects have the ability to adapt chemically. They have chemical adaptations. A plant develops a toxin to fight off these caterpillars and then the, fat, the caterpillars figure out a way to overcome that and be able to feed and thrive on that toxin. So constantly adapting and changing and co-evolving with their hosts. They also can fly and they're very small. And that's one reason why insects are very successful. They can get away from predators. They can find different niches. They can live in small environments. They don't need a lot of food sometimes and they don't need a lot of water. They also have the ability to go through kind of a resting stage, diapause and estivation. So diapause is what happens usually in the, in the winter time where they get cold, metabolic process shuts down, and they wait until environmental conditions are better. Estivation is a little bit different. That usually is when it's like a drought or a summer situation and there's no food or water. And so the body will shut down until those in environmental situations become more um, pleasing to them and they're able to survive better. Another reason for insects' incredible success is metamorphosis. And we'll talk about this much more in depth. It's a very important thing to study and understand when you're learning about insects and entomology. Metamorphosis is a literal change in form. So these insects are completely changing the way that they look as they go from egg to larva to pupa and adult. Think about a monarch caterpillar. That's one thing that we can all probably visualize in our minds. That egg looks, looks nothing like the caterpillar. Every time that caterpillar grows, if you know anything about monarchs, it changes significantly. Then when it becomes a pupa, it doesn't even resemble what it did as, as a larva, and the adult resembles nothing like any of the other life stages. So they have this total change in form, and this change in form also allows certain insects to eat different food sources and have different hosts, which means that they're more successful because they're not competing with other life stages in order to find food. Um, the ability to change form and go through metamorphosis is, the, is this process that we call molting and they shed their exoskeleton, their bones on the outside, they shed their outer lining and they emerge soft and ready to become this new life stage. We will cover this more in depth, but it is important to note that only the immature forms can molt. Once you've become an adult and you have fully developed wings, which is usually what means you're an adult, you will never molt again. So a teeny tiny fly flying around, you can't say it's a baby fly. It's not. It's an adult fly that's as large as it's going to get. It will never molt again, but it's just small. So let's look at some of the different types of metamorphosis or life stages or life cycles that insects have. 
The term metamorphosis, complete metamorphosis, or complete life cycle kind of goes interchangeably. Another term for complete a complete life cycle is holometabolus. It's the whole thing. That's how I remember it at least. And these are the insects that most of us studied in school when we learned about life stages of insects. These are things that have a larva and a pupa stage. There are four total stages. Mom lays a bunch of eggs. The eggs hatch out and turn into larva. We call those larva caterpillars if it will be a butterfly or a moth. We call them grubs usually if it will turn into a beetle. And we call them maggots if they'll turn into a fly. But they're all larva. So these larvae's job is to eat and grow and get big and fat. And when they're finished becoming big and fat, then they will unzip their body and, and underneath is that pupa case that they're forming. They don't wrap it around themselves like many of us assume. It's developing, the new stage is always developing on the inside. And then they just unzip themselves and come out as uh, the second larva, another molted larva or the pupa or the adult. Pupa stage is generally called the resting stage, although a lot is happening me metabolically inside of them. And then they emerge from that pupa stage as an adult. And most insects will overwinter or go through the cold weather where there's no food, temperatures are too low, as either the, the egg or the pupa stage, which allows them to overcome those cold temperatures because they just kind of stop doing what they are doing. They stop developing. Here are some other examples of an insect with a complete life cycle. This is a beetle, a lady beetle, ladybug, ladybird beetle, whatever you want to call it. Mom lays a bunch of little orangey golden yellow colored eggs. I bet you've never, I bet few of you realize that that is the larva of the ladybug. Looks kind of like a little alligator tail to me. And then they become a pupa after they're finished gobbling up a bunch of aphids and then finally emerge as the adult to start that stage all over again. Some, uh, Holometabolous insects can be aquatic, such as the mosquito. So a mosquito lays its eggs on the water surface. Those eggs, and these are all out of order actually, um, those eggs will hatch into the top picture, which is the little, uh, they're called wigglers, that live in the water, feed on the organic matter in the dirty water. They will turn into that round fetus looking thing on the far right picture that is their pupa stage doesn't feed, no pupa feed, but these are unique because they move around. And then they'll emerge as the pupa on the bottom left-hand picture, which as the adult, I'm sorry, from the pupa stage out of the water to start this process all over again. Now, being holometabolous is a very beneficial way to be. These are more advanced insects. They have been on the earth a little bit longer. And we know this because they're not competing with mom and dad for food. So let's think about um, like the monarch butterfly, they have totally different mouth parts. They're feeding on completely different things. The larvae are going to feed on milkweed, whereas the adults are feeding on nectar, not the plants. And they may feed on milkweed nectar, but they're not feeding on the plant material. Same thing with mosquitoes, right? The larvae are feeding on things in the water, whereas the adults, if it's a female, is feeding on blood. Completely different mouth parts, different hosts, different food sources. So there's not that competition for food between the mom and the and the between parents and babies. Now, hemimetabolists or individuals that have a gradual metamorphosis or an incomplete metamorphosis or incomplete life cycle are older insects, more primitive insects, because they do not have this total change in, in, in form. It's more gradual or it's not a complete thing. They only have an egg, which is, which is laid by the parents, and then these nymph stages or immature stages, which really closely resemble what the adult looks like. The adult stage looks like the nymph, but it now has fully developed wings and is generally more hard bodied but they are competing with their offspring for the same food source. So this isn't a benefit, which is why we believe that hemimetabolous insects are more primitive insects. And here's some examples. This is a, a green stink bug. She lays these kind of barrel shaped, funny looking eggs. You can see the middle picture is the nymph. Um, and it looks similar to the adult, but because it doesn't have the wings that cover the back, that tells us that it is not an adult. And then the adult tends to be darker in color, textured differently because it has wings, um, but overall still resembles the same shape and general look as its baby form. 
Some insects will lay their eggs in water that are hemimetabolous, but these guys, um, we don't call their immatures nymphs, we call them naiads. So if you hear the term naiad, it is something that lays its babies in the water, its eggs in the water, and they, the immatures develop there. So these are really um, dragonflies and damselflies, uh, mayflies and stoneflies. There's very few that actually do that. But a naiad is an immature, aquatic immature. And then there's another type of metamorphosis that's called ametabolous, and these are the most primitive of insects. Ametabolous individuals have no metamorphosis or no life cycle, and that's because the adults have no wings. So the best example that most of us recognize are silverfish. It's really hard to determine that the babies look like the, that the babies are the babies and the immatures and not the adult form because there really isn't a whole change in form. The immatures just look like identical but smaller versions of the adult. So, you know, the last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it, right? And I think all of you as naturalists who enjoy nature appreciate that there are so many things, everything has a purpose and a place, can understand that and appreciate that quote. All insects can be beneficial. Not every insect is harmful. Even those that are harmful probably have some benefit to them. Even um, an 80s mosquito, which transmits a ton of diseases that are really terrible, in the male form, they're pollinators a little bit because they're going after plants. So there, there is a benefit and a reason to all insects, and there are many, many, many beneficial insects. If you are a beneficial insect, you are either a predator or a parasitoid, a pollinator, or you're a recycler or a decomposer. If you are interested in learning more about beneficial insects, then I would really highly encourage you to go to our uh, YouTube channel, My Extension 210. Just Google My Extension 210 YouTube, and you'll find our website. And we have it uh, set up in different sections. And so you would go to my section, which is entomology. And I have a two part series of beneficial insects. I have parasites and parasitoids. Um, I've got recyclers, and I also have some webinars on pollinators. So if you really want to get more information about that, go there. You can watch a whole, you know, 32-hour webinar on that great uh, on that great resource. But very quickly, to give you just a, um, a quick idea of what predators, parasitoids, recyclers, and our pollinators are, predators and parasitoids are the killers. Predators are insects that go after their prey, eat things about their size, or a little bit smaller, and consume it. Kill it, it's gone, it's no longer there. They gobble it up. A parasitoid utilizes its host to complete a part of its life cycle. They're generally much smaller than the host is, um, and they keep it alive long enough to complete their life cycle, but while they're developing inside of their host, the host doesn't feel good, and so it's not doing the feeding or the damage that it would be doing otherwise. So. D examples of predators are ladybugs, assassin bugs, praying mantises, and even this little lacewing down here at the bottom. They are eating and consuming things that are smaller than them, and they kill them immediately. A parasitoid is developing inside of something that is generally it small is generally larger than it is. Of course, that top picture is an exception to this rule, but you can see that poor, probably it looks like a beetle larvae is filled with maggots of probably some fly or a wasp that are developing inside and feeding on the inside of this poor bug. And it's not going to feel good. You wouldn't feel good if you were filled with a parasite like that, right? So they generally um, are, the par they parasitize things that are larger than themselves and they will keep that prey alive long enough to complete their own life cycle. Really, really alien-like um, situations that are really interesting if you're into that thing. And then our decomposers are those things that break down, decaying organic matter. These are things that we think are gross, right? Maggots and cockroaches, flies, but they are very important and vital to our ecosystem because if we didn't have them, we'd have a lot of junk in our, in our landfills. We'd have a lot of dog poop in your backyard, a lot of dead animals that never broke down. And so they're incredibly important. They're just kind of not as um, appealing to us as the nice, feel -a good pollinators can be. Some common decomposers beyond those that are laying their eggs in trash 
or feeding on dead bodies would be those rhino beetles or, or the Hercules beetles or the big giant beetles that in the grub form are big, huge grubs, you know, as big as the, can fill the palm of your hand. You find them in your compost bin, but they're also an environmental indicator. They're breaking down organic matter. So it tells you where they're found. You have great organic matter in that soil. Now these are large um, beetles. The smaller beetles only found in turf feed on the roots of turf, but those large ones that you find are not feeding on the roots. They're feeding on decaying organic matter. If you're concerned about them hurting your plant, found in a pot, found in your compost, found in your garden bed, ask yourself what's decaying and why are they there? If your plants aren't decaying, they're not going to feed on it. And then even dung beetles are considered decomposers, right? They're helping reduce the amount of dung, cow pats in a pasture, dung in your backyard from your um, from your dogs or your or wildlife that are coming through. And then pollinators, everyone understands that pollinators are a beneficial insect. Pollinators are moving pollen from one flower to another. And what's amazing is that they are very selfish about this. They don't want to move the pollen from flower to flower. What they really want to do is they want to take it for themselves. Pollen is their protein. And so social insects are usually getting that protein to feed to their babies, like many bees. Even solitary bees are making pollen balls to feed as the protein for their babies when the, when the eggs hatch. Butterflies are going after the nectar, and so they're just kind of okay pollinators because they accidentally pick up that pollen, but they're kind of the gateway pollinator. Everyone loves a butterfly. Now you can move into more intense and serious pollinators. There are lots of animals that pollinate. 90% of flowering plants rely on an animal to pollinate it for fertilization, but of the 200,000 species of animals that pollinate, only 1,000 are not an insect. So insects get a lot of attention and there's good reason for that because there are just more of them and because there are more of them, they are doing most of the pollinating. And there's lots of different types of pollinators. It isn't just butterflies and bees. It's also wasps and moths and mini beetles and even some flies. I'm gonna stop here and there is a part two section on classifying insects where we're gonna go over the orders of insects and. Um, how to recognize certain types of insects. This was just a really quick introduction to entomology, but if you're interested in understanding some of the ways to identify an insect so that you're able to use a field guide properly and, and know what it is that you're dealing with, then go ahead and, and on this same YouTube channel, go ahead and click on that and we'll cover insect orders and how to identify them. My name is Molly Keck. I hope you enjoyed this Into 101 very quick, very fast introductory lesson. Um, I am with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and I uh, hope you gain an appreciation for insects like I have now. <laughs>